Welcome to the Monroe Live podcast. Today, Sandy Monroe and I are going to go over the history of Monroe and Associates and go back a little further than that. We're going to go into your time before you started Monroe at Valiant Tool, Ford Motor Company, and then we're going to fast forward all the way to current, what we do now, as well as how we started Monroe Live. But let's rewind back to the 80s, Sandy. Can you tell me? The 80s? <laughs> Uh, we can go back even further than that. You said toolmaker. So um, I started my trade uh, in 1966 when I was 16. My, uh, my dad, up till that point in time, I'd been working on different farms. I grew up in a farming area. And uh, my dad decided that um, uh, at 16, I was really 18. So uh, he got me into a place called Sentry Spray. They made... Um, machine, they made automation and uh, pollution control equipment. And uh, so I got into the trade a little bit earlier, two years before normal. And um, so consequently, going through high school, because I'd been trained, I was training into being a tool maker. Uh, the high school I went to was a technical high school, WD Low. And um, so I'm a low tech graduate. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so I went to, I went to that school <clears throat> and, um, and as a um, journeyman or apprentice toolmaker, uh, these toys that we had us made us, or they had us make in, uh, in high school were like maybe an hour project, um, because you, you move fast when you're on the factory floor. So I had all my projects done in about a week. <laughs> so uh, I got a chance to move quite quickly uh, through the, uh, through the, the general types of things that you'd have in school. Um, I, uh, I did well in, uh, in high school, uh, mainly because, <clears throat> mainly because um, I was the ugliest kid on the planet. Um, I had cystic acne. So um, things that Things that normally people would go to dances or have dates and whatnot. I didn't get any of that stuff. Um, in fact, I had very, very, very few friends. So I went through high school um, quickly, went into college uh, after I got my ticket and after everybody basically coaxed me into going into, uh, into engineering. Um, when I started the engineering, into the engineering world, I went back to Century Spray. And because I had moved around, you get paid different rates when you're a journeyman. So I went back there and uh, they, they wanted me to come into the shop because I was good at finding mistakes with, uh, with the materials or the, the drawings that I was given. Um, I moved fairly quickly through the ranks. And uh, so I started as a, basically a blueprint boy at about 21, 22, something like that. And um, by the time I got to be 27, I was the chief engineer of Valiant Machine Tool. Now that kind of at that time, it was kind of a big deal because Valiant was about the biggest machine tool, privately held machine tool company uh, in North America. And I had quite a number of people working for me. And that's when I found out that <laughs> I'm not a people person. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, um, when I was about 30, um, I got an offer from, from Ford Motor Company. We had done quite a number of different um, conveying systems with automation, with robotics and whatnot. And I've been working in robotics uh, forever since the very first uh, Unimate robots. It's yeah. was like this, a long time. Was this Ford Canada or Ford US? No, Ford you, Canada. Okay. Yeah, Ford in Canada. Yeah. So Ford in Canada gave me an offer. Um, it basically... Uh, doubled my salary. Um, so I wound up losing, I don't know, hundred and something people that, that worked for me. I went down to none. They, they, I, t I didn't, all I had to do was report to one guy and I had no people working for me. So I liked that idea. And uh, when I got to Ford, it was just before the oil embargo and, um, and just before the Japanese invasion. 
So the engines that they made at Ford was a 351W, which is now the five liter, and a 400 CID monster that uh, sucked gas like there was no tomorrow. <clears throat> that line almost, I think it might have gone up for maybe an hour or two, but for the most part, there was no need for a, an engine that size. And so consequently, Ford was looking to reduce the number of people that they had at that facility. Tragically, um, the guy that was running it, uh, his name was Norm Bake. He was the guy that actually hired me. He was the chief engineer. And he wanted me to bring, he wanted me to come in there because he wanted to robotize the whole engine plant. And uh, I get, I was given a free hand. So I could design pretty much anything. And as a matter of fact, in my case, uh, or in the case that we've got, there's a little plaque that says built by Ford skilled tradesmen. Um, I actually designed and then they built um, a whole bunch of pieces of automation to make things happen. Um, but my big break, and, and, uh, and that, that kept us limping along with the 351W, but um, my big break came when um, I did a, a change to uh, the uh, Conrond line. And when I got in there, they couldn't meet production ever. It was the bottleneck for the whole plant. Um, even at lower volumes, it was still a real problem. So uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I came up with a design. And in essence, what I did was I got rid of all of the, they had these gigantic 15, 18-foot diameter um, accumulators, and they would just go like this, and what would happen was the rods would come in at the top, and as this thing moved, it was a uh, helix, so it just would walk these things down, then it would be going into whatever the machine was. I got rid of those. I got rid of all kinds of dividers and stuff like that, and made it, we called it the straight gut system. Now we'd call it lean manufacturing. And anyways, I put all this stuff in, and uh, after a huge amount of arguing and whatnot, I turned it on, <clears throat> and it worked. It worked really, really well. Yeah. So and that was in Windsor. That was at the Windsor plant. Yeah. yeah. You, you also spent some time in Lima, Ohio, right? Oh, uh, that's further down the line. But okay. let's uh, to get to Lima. Um, we had this guy. His name was Don Carlson, and um, he was from uh, engine division staff. And what he was trying to do is figure out who he could cherry pick uh, to bring back to engine division staff in, uh, in Dearborn. So anyway, when this thing got up to speed, uh, he was there. He, uh, he was a very unusual guy. He used to eat cigars. Uh, yeah, he never lit them up. He would just chew on them and then they'd get shorter and shorter. I never saw anybody else do that, but uh, that was Don Carlson. Are you sure he swallowed the cigars? I have no clue. I didn't see him spit, but uh, but and spitting tobacco juice into coolant is not a real good idea. And that's basically what you've got in an engine plant. There's coolant everywhere. So if he did, I don't know where he did it, and if he ate them, I really didn't pay that much attention. I, I wasn't really looking to see where those cigars went to. <clears throat> but anyway... He went across the border and um, he recommended to the people at engine division staff that, you know, maybe I could be um, somebody that they want to bring across. So uh, I went for the interview um, and uh, my boss, Jerry Luke, uh, you know, he was talking like, well, we've got a lot of people here that we're interviewing and um, I don't know if you're really up to par and, Yada, yada, yada. And you didn't go to Michigan. University of Michigan was very, very popular. So, and he had a Michigan ring. So at the end of the day, um, he was giving me the gears. And then um, Don Carlson and uh, Ron Baru, who was his boss, they came walking in during the interview and they said, hey, look, <laughs> you hired this kid yet or what? Kid, I was 30. But anyway, I was the youngest guy there, believe it or not. Wow. I got hired in to engine division staff, and I was the youngest guy in that group. It was amazing how old everybody was. And, so anyway. And if this was in the late 60s, early no, 70s? No, no, this was, I started off in the 60s. Now we're into uh, 
We're into 1979 is when I, 79. or 1978 when I joined Ford. And now going into engineering staff would be probably 1980. Yeah, if, if the people were old, if they're in their 50s and 60s, that means they were working there in the 50s, 40s, and 50s. 40s and, yeah. yeah 40s mostly, 40s and 50s. It's like, there mag, was, it's like Magneto days. Uh, it was a long, long time ago. I know that for sure. And a lot of them got double... Um, because they were in World War II or in Korea. Double? Double the, the number. So if you were in World War II and you were there overseas for, or you joined up and when you've been there for two, three years, that gave you six years on your, um, on your um, seniority? seniority status. Oh. Yeah, so oh. it was a kind of a cool thing that they did at Ford. But anyway, everybody was old. Everybody was older than I was. And uh, so we're probably in about 1980, 1981, something like that. Yeah. And then uh, during that time, I, I, my first assignment was actually the Essex engine plant. So I launched that. I didn't design it, but I launched it for the engine assembly and test area. And it was very fast. Um, we had had a lot of problems with suppliers, but I was pretty good at knowing what to do and how to do it. And in essence, what I did was I, I bought off the equipment from the supply community, especially one really bad supplier, which I later on had blackballed. But anyhow, um, uh, I bought it off, and then I used our tradespeople to uh, get it up and running. And it was amazing. I mean, that's the first time I'd ever seen people having nervous breakdowns. Uh, the plant manager had a nervous breakdown. <clears throat> they took him away. Production manager, he had a nervous breakdown. He was gone for like a month, and then they brought him back. People really, I mean, production was everything in those days, and uh, when things didn't work, especially because of the Chinese, uh, or sorry, the Japanese invasion, <clears throat> they were really serious about getting this yeah. V6 on the road. So Japanese invasion, you mentioned that two or three times already. Give a little context to that because we may have viewers that might be thinking about the 40s here. And you're talking about the automotive invasion. Yeah, well, the Japanese didn't really, well, they, they bombed Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor but, but anyway, the Japanese invasion for me was the, the bringing in of Japanese vehicles uh, into the American market during the oil embargo. And when that happened, believe me, um, uh, Ford was in terrible shape. We were going bankrupt, uh, no question about it. I was in the uh, I was in the states by then, and uh, it was it was really really tough, really tough. The amount of um, layoffs and whatnot were just staggering. In fact, the only reason that it's the Ford Motor Company stuck around was because. Um, the Henry, the the Ford family put more money into it. <clears throat> we were told they sold a whole bunch of property or something in California. <clears throat> Anyhow, um, during that time frame, uh, we we needed to find out how it was that the Japanese were building cars and building, especially in my case, engines and transmissions. So I got sent off to uh, Japan. And I, the, my first trip was in 1983, and I could not believe how different things were with the Japanese, how they produced their vehicles, um, the designs of their machine tools and whatnot were all hugely different than what we saw. Anyway, I brought back a 4x4x4 a four by four by four pallet full of stuff. It was a huge box, and um, I had parts, I had drawings, I had a whole bunch of things because I had gone to the classes, the orientation classes. I was the only guy in those classes. There was supposed to be 30 people going, but I was the only one that showed up for the classes. And um, they gave me all the hints I needed. I, I bring presents. Uh, it's not the United States. If you don't bring a present, then it's an insult and on and on. So um, when I, the trip took off from Detroit, landed in Seattle. And when I got to Seattle, I just went around and bought up scotch because at the time you couldn't import scotch into, um, into Japan, but you could bring it in as a present. 
So um, I filled, I bought so much scotch, they actually gave me a free suitcase. And when I went over, um, we went to these different plants, and I was the lowest ranking guy, period. Um, I would, uh, <clears throat> at the end, I would just hand the plant manager or whatever executive was there, I'd hand him a bottle of scotch and Don Maracato. And uh, anyway, the next thing I know, I get invited to parties and, uh, <clears throat> oh, you want that? No problem, I'll give you that. So I brought back a whole bunch of stuff. Everybody else brought back brochures. And uh, that didn't didn't really cut it with the, uh, John Scollard was the vice president of manufacturing and he uh, was very unhappy with, with what came back from the other uh, about 25 guys, 25 kind of executives. Now was Deming in Japan at this point? Or had, oh yeah, he had we, come back? we knew oh. about Deming. This episode of the Monroe Live podcast is brought to you by T-Raps. Hey, Sandy, did you know that T-Raps is a family-owned business just like Monroe and Associates? They're EV owners and enthusiasts turned entrepreneurs. That's right, Corey. Uh, these people know EV, so they take the time to create products that fit precisely into your vehicle. We got products from T-Raps here at Monroe for the F-150 Lightning and our Model 3. I got to say, these things are really high quality. Yep, that's true, Sandy. T-Raps makes everything from protective films to organizing trays, and everything fits perfectly to your EV, whether you've got a Tesla, a Rivian, or a Ford. Plus, T-Raps uses the highest quality materials in the industry, and they're all designed and produced right here in the USA. You said it, Corey. And T-Raps has video showcasing the quick and easy installation of each product, so DIY car upgrades have never been easier. Visit TRAPS.com to browse their collection of EV protectors and accessories. That's T-W-R-A-P-S.com and use discount code MONROE for 10% off your order. But I didn't bump into him <clears throat> until uh, the next year. And uh, for Deming, I was in a coolant pit, which is a really nasty place, at the second launch of, um, of the Dearborn engine plant. They were making the Erica engine. It wasn't being produced fast enough. And although I wasn't uh, really assigned to chip cutting, they knew that I had done those machines, worked on, the, designed those kinds of machines before. So um, I was sent down as a, because everybody was old. Nobody's going to crunk. I mean, it just, they were all old. So I, uh, I went to the Dearborn engine plant. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, you can smell the difference between coolant that's any good and stuff that's gone rancid. So I said, uh, you need to clean these pits. Anyway, I took the first one on, and uh, the sludge on the side of the pit was like three, four inches thick. It was like really nasty. And so I went down there because I found out that, I mean, if you didn't go in with the maintenance people, <clears throat> the job wouldn't get done. So you remove the floor over the top of the pit and that basically lets some air in, but you still have to wear a full um, respiratory system with the clothing to go along with it because this stuff is nasty. So I went down and I got along with the maintenance people because I was a tradesman and there is a, a relationship that I had. So they're uh, in there with um, high pressure flushers and whatnot, cutting this stuff up, throwing it in buckets, taking it out, and basically making it ready for the new coolant that's going to come in. And uh, this guy, one of the guys in the office, we called him the golden boy. He had everything going for him, <clears throat> and he never went in a plant, never. Anyway, he came down the gorilla cage, and I'm looking at him, and uh, it's very difficult to talk. And, uh, and so he's yelling that um, I'm supposed to go someplace. Uh, Jerry Luke, my boss, his boss too, wants me to go to this meeting. And so I, <clears throat> I got up um, out, of the, out of the pit and I took off those clothes, but you still stink. You really smell bad. And um, I didn't have time to go and change. I lived a long ways. I'd have to go back across the border. So um, I, I went the way I was, and it was at World Headquarters in the, uh, it was at the uh, big uh, 
conference center that they have on the first floor. And I thought, well, I'll just sit in the back because I stink. And uh, I opened up the door, and that's where everybody was, in the back. So I opened up the other door, which is the first, you know, like uh, eight, eight or ten rows, and there was nobody there. So I just went over, and I thought, oh, I'll just sit underneath the podium and listen to what this guy has to say because I had no idea who he truly was. I'd heard his name, but I didn't know yeah. who he was. And anyway, so Red Polling introduced us, and he said, um, ladies and gentlemen, Oh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are honored to have, <coughs> oh, uh, uh, we're honored to have uh, Dr. Deming here. He's going to talk to us about quality. Thank you very much. Let's give him a big round of applause. And he <laughs> ran off the stage. Dr. Deming comes walking up and he, he looks, looks around. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about quality and manufacturing by the smell of it, I'd say we've got at least one manufacturing person here. <laughs> <laughs> and then he went on, and I mean, the, the, the speech, his, his lecture went on for like four hours. He took a break in the middle to take a nap and have lunch. I never, I couldn't believe, I couldn't, I was so far into it, it wasn't even funny. Quality and stuff like that, coming from the, from the machine tool world where, you know, half a thou makes a big difference. Listening to him, everything made total logical sense. Uh, so anyways, that's when I got a chance to meet him. And then we hung around together for until a month before he died. Uh, uh, now, this is in the mid or late 80s? This is in the early 80s, 83, 84, something like that. Yeah. And, um, and I became a disciple. I took all the classes. Um, and... Uh, during that time frame, I was sent around to different plants and whatnot. But then what wound up happening was um, Taurus was coming online and they needed a new engine. The engine that they wanted to put in it was the Vulc it was the uh, SXV6, but it was too big. They needed something different. So they devised the Vulcan V6, which was a 60 degree V6. And by now, I had been working with product design engineering along with my job. And we were trying to figure out how to get rid of waste because I was super duper into waste, getting rid of waste so that we could um, get product out the door faster at a higher quality. So when this engine came through, I worked directly with the chief engineer on that engine and uh, we took about 30 percent of the parts out 30 percent sorry not parts parts and operations out um and yeah it was hugely different and um i was fully confident that most of the stuff that we would have normally had people doing the job on i could i could automate so anyway um now we got to have an engine line and so uh Max Jarosik, who was the vice president of Powertrain, I had had a number of conferences with him, and he knew that I could design stuff. So he said, you need to give me a new engine line for Lima. Uh, but we had already designed one. And actually, what had happened was they decided to use the same engine line as what was going to be used or what had been used at Essex, which I felt was huge and uh, and really ineffective and inefficient. So they uh, brought in the first design, which was the Essex engine plant, pasted it on a wall, <clears throat> went through and documented, you know, all the good points. Then, <laughs> then I brought my design in. So, it, I mean, the thing covered basically a whole wall. Mine was a, a very small drawing and I plastered it up there. And I said, this is what we can do. Uh, we don't need that whole big giant line. We, all we need is what we've got here. And uh, uh, everybody was, I think the English say gobsmacked. It was, it was like nobody knew what to say. What were the big differences? Well, one thing, mine was heavily automated, whereas the Essex plant was not. My plan did not include a whole bunch of uh, repair loops and 
and uh, storage areas. There wasn't a whole lot of float in the, in my my design. My design used a carousel uh, for hot tests, and I was petitioning to try and get rid of hot tests uh, because I said we can do cold motoring, and that'll tell us everything we need to know. We don't need a hot test, but the rule was we had to have a hot test. So I made a gigantic um, dial uh, that um, would receive the engines. They go around the the dial and then be ejected. If if there was a problem, <clears throat> you took it off that stand, put it on an inner stand, because this thing was very big in diameter, put it on the inner stand, guys would work on it, fix it up, and then they could bring it back onto the line. It's like a reverse repair bay, and put it in, and, and away it'd go. So it worked out very, very well, and quite frankly, we almost never used that inner ring. Uh, the that's the first time that I got nominated for the Henry Ford Award, um, and I didn't get it, <laughs> but it um, it really really worked well, and um, the the guys at Lima were very appreciative because they were talking about maybe shutting the Lima plant down and dispersing what was there, so yeah. they were happy that they had a new a new engine. That that Lima plant's still there. I went yeah. and visited in two thousand and. <clears throat> think 11 or 12 yeah i had a buddy who worked down there and he's like hey you want to come check it out yeah went down they were making the high featured duratec v6 60 degree yeah um dual of red cam yeah that's you know. the that's the same one as the vulcan v6 or i think it's it's an evolution over oh time. yeah well, it's evolutionary right but it it did have um overhead cam it had it had everything the basic engine was there, but they yeah. added probably VVT and yep. things like that. So, anyways, um, variable valve timing. We should. Oh yeah, acronym people <coughs> for doing that. Anyway, um, it went well. Then I designed the Penta engine, or helped design the Penta engine design uh, assembly line, um, and uh, that was one hundred percent manual. <laughs> Actually, kind of a well. Uh, we could skip that story probably. Anyway, um, uh, so I uh, I did fairly well at, at Powertrain, and then uh, Lou Veraldi and uh, Telnac, Jack Telnac, um, kind of promoted me into uh, into the the world of designing cars. So we kind of um, I. Uh, my attitude, um, <laughs> I, I had a, a different attitude than I've got now. And if I thought I was right uh, and somebody else was wrong, either I would do one of two things. I'd just walk away or I'd start telling them why they were stupid. <laughs> Wait, and, how, how have you changed? <laughs> yeah, how have I changed? Yeah, right, oh, on. yeah. <laughs> Believe me, <laughs> you'd notice a change. Anyhow, so um, any they had to do something. So I moved from uh, engineering entirely and moved to finance staff. And when I went to finance staff, if you wanted to buy something and it had anything to do with manufacturing, it was probably going to go through me. And I was the final approval. And if I saw it, if I looked at the product and whatnot, and it looked overly designed, like there were too many parts or whatever, then I would do two things. One, I'm not going to just say there's too many parts. I'm not going to give you the money. I would go in and I would say, look, you can do better. This is, and I do workshops and whatnot. We'd reduce the number of parts. And then after they got done, I'd give them the money for their automation or chip cutting equipment or stamp dies, whatever. I'd, I'd give it to them later, but not, not until I had something that was effective and efficient. And actually... I was nominated three times for the Henry Ford Award, and one of those times was for the um, uh, for the work we did on reducing the number of parts and whatnot in in different products. So, but anyway, uh, at the end of the day, um, I uh, I had a boss who wanted my job, so I was going to be moved from finance staff to manufacturing. I was going to work directly for Bill Scholar. And um, he was the VP of manufacturing. And my boss really wanted that job. So he neglected to put my paperwork in 
to allow me to stay in the country. That, that was kind of a problem. And in about that same time, um, Dr. Deming told me that, uh, Monroe, you need to leave. You'll do much better if you leave Ford Motor Company and start your own company. It worked for me. It'll work for you. And he said that right in front, right in front of uh, one of the vice president, Red Poling, one of the, he was actually the president at the time, I think. Anyhow, so I left in 1988 and, um, ten, and I started. Wasn't it 10 own. years right to the day? It was. I uh, joined the company on the 4th of July. Um, I was sent back to Canada on April the 15th. And I, uh, <laughs> I said, I, <laughs> They said, well, you're an 11 or I can't remember what number it was. I was supposed to be a 13. But anyway, um, <clears throat> they said, uh, you're not getting that promotion and, um, and uh, we got to demote you because we don't, we don't have anybody at that level here at the engine plant that they sent me back to. And so I said, okay, well, then I'm asking for VTP. And he said, what's that? I said, voluntary termination plan. It happens when you reach a certain status. I think grade nine or 10 or something like that. I want it. And uh, there was a lot of arguments for a while, but I had a, I, I had a letter from uh, Don Peterson, who was the president CEO, I think at the time, and, um, and said, what a wonderful job I was doing. And um, I said, I'm calling him because I got his number. I'll call him if, uh, if I don't get it. So I got that. Um, a lot of things happened at the same time. <laughs> um, uh, so I got kicked out of the country. Uh, my wife and I decided to have a divorce and, um, and I got VTP. So that's how I started the company sitting in the <laughs> living in my wife's uh, Bronco. Because it used to be mine, but uh, during the divorce, I gave everything away. I wound up with, I wound up with a green garbage bag full of clothes, <laughs> and that was it. No kidding, I didn't take anything else. Plus, I had alimony, so I started off the company. And in essence, I wanted nothing ever to do with automotive again. So, um, I worked for FMC uh, to do farm equipment, Ingersoll Rand on uh, industrial equipment. Machine tool companies like F. Joseph Lamb, um, all kinds of things, but not automotive. What about the aerospace? Weren't you working with Boeing early on? Uh, no, I was working with... Uh, McDonnell Douglas? No, um, Lear, Lear Astronics. Uh, I was working on um, flight controllers and whatnot, uh, which turned into kind of a problem and an opportunity at the same time. So, so that's we, how I got my green card. So actually. we have almost a hundred employees right now at Monroe, but early yeah. on it was you plus a few, right? Yeah. Tom so Short, Tom Dan Short McCarthy, and Dan McCarthy plus um, plus Nancy Lurch. That that was the original company. Uh, it grew and shrunk and grew and shrunk, but to, but in essence, those were the four people that really made things start to happen. So Tom Short. Um, he had, I used to hire him when I was at Ford. He was a very good trainer and he knew everything about the stuff that we used to, we used to call it, um, uh, design for automation. And, uh, Dan McCarthy was working for Phillips and, uh, the guys at Phillips said, uh, they were going to shut down their operations in, I think it was either New Jersey or New York. I can't remember which, but anyway, and uh, one of the guys there said, hey, um, you know, because I'd been doing speaking with, um, with uh, what do you call them? Um, um, with the SAE, SME, uh, and Management Roundtable. And so everybody kind of knew what we were, what I was doing at Ford. And Ford was making a ton of money. I mean, a ton. It made, it, they were within spitting distance of... Um, they were within spitting distance of uh, GM, um, who was really in deep trouble at the time. Uh, their their cars were way over cost and whatnot. They weren't making any money. So anyhow, um, and I was also working with NASA from the from as far back as the Challenger thing. So 
uh, I had these, these customers, they all paid well and whatnot. And uh, like I said, I really did not have, uh, I wasn't living in an apartment. I, you know, I traveled a lot. So I just lived from hotel to hotel. And when I came back to the Detroit area, I just book another room or, uh, you know, or sleep at a friend's house or something. And, um, and that, that kind of, that kind of was the, the life that I had. The only thing that really I had that was unique was a bag phone. At the time, cell phones were really, really, really rare. And, um, <clears throat> and if you got a bag phone, uh, that number wasn't given out to anybody. It was a private number and, uh, it just, so anyway, the, where I'm working, um, you know, dancing around the country and whatnot. And, um, and as luck would have it, I wound up, um, I wound up getting a call that, um, let me just turn this off. Um, I got a call on that bag phone and it was a guy named uh, George Rodenback. Wrote him wrote him back. I think it's something like that. Anyway, and George said, um, um, hey, uh, I was wondering, uh, can you come into GM um, at the CPC headquarters and uh, give us a speech? And I said, I charge by the day. And he said, well, how much is it? I told him. <clears throat> he said, okay, that's fine. He said, can you come here at about 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock? Uh, I won't get through the whole day uh, because I've got, no, it doesn't matter. Just come in. So I came into the, uh, into the meeting and um, I gave them about two hours of things that we had done with Ford and with other companies. And by the way, Ford was in, there was a lot of people who were unhappy that I, I got uh, moved uh, or got a, the bums rush basically. <clears throat> and so um uh, my bosses gave me the permission to utilize some of the stuff that, that I had done at Ford. And he also gave me all my paintings that I had done and we use them still. Um, anyhow, I, uh, uh, I showed him some of the stuff and before I got done with an hour and a half, about an hour and a half, they said, okay, that's fine. Everybody can leave now. And I thought, wow. This is, I'm going to probably not get my money. Anyhow, the uh, the deal was that they had already made up their mind and they, all they wanted to do was talk about how I was going to get rid of my customers, current customers, and work exclusively for General Motors. And that lasted right up until, um, that lasted right up until, what was his name? Ignacio Lopez. Ignacio Lopez. Yeah. A very evil man. Anyhow, he um, he told me what he wanted me to do, and uh, I really didn't think that betraying people in the supply community to make him look better uh, was going to work into my plan. So I um, I fired General. I I walked away from General Motors. But before I did that, we got the opportunity to work on EV one. So we turned around the Cadillac uh, the Cadillac lineup. The, um, uh, I mean, the F car, the Camaro Firebird, that was dead. Um, we, we, we salvaged that. I got a lot of accolades. In fact, there's tons of them hanging on my, our walls and little awards and whatnot. We really did a good job there. But uh, Ignacio's plan was evil. And um, sometimes that's what people think they need or want. Anyhow. So, um, <clears throat> so we had a tough time there for about two months and then the phone rang and McDonald Douglas phoned us up and we started working with them. And that's where we got some serious background in, in designing aircraft and whatnot or redesigning aircraft. We made huge gains, but their, their leadership was just, in fact, we put out something me, myself and Michael Lidke put out a, I'm on Roll Live YouTube, uh, and I, I highly recommend, if you want to see why companies go out of business, watch that one. It's amazing yeah. how they, they ruined uh, they ruined McDonnell Douglas. Yeah, a, a lot of people watch that. <clears throat> yeah. They ask our 
producer Aaron, how many people viewed that video? Um, let me see here. It looks like sixty six thousand as of today. Mm. Mm. Sixty six thousand. But really and truly, anybody who's thinking about um, going into management should watch that thing because, quite frankly, everything you can do wrong, um, they did. So, so Sandy, talk a little bit about. Monroe's methodology for the first 10, 15 years. So we have lean design. We own that trademark. Yeah. But also you oftentimes say it's 90% psychology and 10% technology. Right. So to let our viewers know and our listeners know how we actually impact clients. Because we can name all these products we've worked on. We can say we've helped them. But how do you get the job done? Getting the job done is by changing people's minds. Um, the uh, When we... We used to do a lot of workshops, a lot. In fact, we're doing them again now. It's kind of like what's old is new. <clears throat> and when you first come into somebody's uh, product, and maybe you've never even seen it before. In many cases, I never saw the inside of a missile before I started working on one. And when you start looking at it and you start questioning anything, their backs go up. I mean, the engineers have something we call the ugly baby syndrome. It's their baby. It's the closest thing a man can come to in order to be like a woman. A woman can create children. A man, the best he can do is design something that you can put into the marketplace. Anyway, uh, they get really unhappy. But you can change their mind um, slowly if you if you show them the reason and the rationale. And usually what we do is we start off with using the, the lean design method uh, through training. We give them one day's worth of training. And in essence, what they do is they, they learn how to see things differently and learn how to change the rules. We, we have a whole bunch of cards and tricks and stuff like that. And they learn that not everything they thought was true is really true. And when we go through these things, we're not, we're not really redesigning their product at this point, but what we are doing is redesigning the way they think about a problem. So at the end of the day, um, that process that we use, the lean design profits, profit uh, process um, has helped Anything you can imagine from Barbie to the space station. Everything that the, everything we've ever worked on, we use the same process. And uh, like I say, we've saved companies from going out of business. We've taught it all over the world. It's been an amazing ride using the process that we've got. And then also the, cro <laughs> the cross-industry pollination is really valuable. Yes, so yeah. many people think that all we do is tear down EVs. But right. we've worked on hundreds, maybe Thousands. even close to a thousand engines and transmissions. Right. Yeah. Um, so that gives us a lot of context on how those systems were designed and deployed for all these years. So you can actually apply some of what we've learned there on thermal systems for EVs. Um, and then the cross industry pollination is huge because the aerospace requirements are so stringent. Sometimes um, you're able to look at how things are accomplished there from a a uh, light weighting perspective, the, right. the use of honeycombs and all sorts of interesting material sure. choices. Yeah. You can apply that to the automotive industry. And um, that's something that I was drawn to Monroe in 2005 as an intern is I was essentially pitched that I was going to be able to work on a lot of different industries. And it was true. So, yeah. so that brings us up to pretty much the end of the nineties and at that point, I know for a fact that Monroe had less than 47 employees. Right. Because I, when I was hired in 2005, I was given my employee number. So at Monroe, you're employee number one. Dan and Tom were like two and three or three and four. And then as everyone's hired, it just has grown. Right. And in 2005, <clears throat> I was given employee number 47. Right. But at the time, the company only had 25 total employees. So from... 1988, 89 to 2005, 
we essentially have had retained, you had retained over 50% of every employee you've ever hired. Well, actually, it's different than that even because we had guys that uh, left to go in, uh, you know, seek their fortune somewhere else, hated it, and came back. Yeah. And every time we got a new employee number, it meant it could have meant that you left and came back. Like Archer, Archer left three, four times, four times. Um, one time, so uh, I, I don't want to get into his private life. Yeah. But anyway, he, he came and went back four times. So there's four of your 47 in there somewhere. But at the end of the day, the, uh, the, the, the stuff that was happening when you came on board, I mean, we had already, we, we'd been working on the uh, 787. That was a huge success. The Mini, we, we led that parade. Um, club car. I mean, club car. All kinds of things uh, that, that required uh, a deep understanding of material science and making money. So all of our products and projects that were big, I mean, new product development, they all turned out to be uh, truly successful. Yeah. And then from <clears throat> 2005 to 2009, it was a transition period for Monroe. Um, I was an intern at the time, but I noticed you started hiring more people and putting them on salary, which was not the way the company was yeah. founded early on. You were more like hired gun commission consultants. Yeah. yeah. So people who worked at Monroe would essentially get a piece of the stuff they worked on. Right. But when you weren't working, you didn't get any money. Yeah. It motivated the employees in a unique way. Um, but the transition, uh, you started hiring some salaried people, and then 08, 09 hit. So that really derailed a lot of your plans with Michigan Sats and NASA and the that plane paradigm. you were work on, yeah, working on. Yeah, So Tell that story. <laughs> yeah, we... We were, um, <clears throat> we had three different venues or three different directions that the company was working in. One of them was the traditional, you know, we do a workshops and, uh, and we work it on certain projects. And, and then the second group, um, they were kind of, um, they were focused on new product development. The, the group that, uh, that was primarily, in charge of that was the one that I was leading, which was the Paradigm aircraft. And then there was a third group, and they were working on um, benchmarking. Um, and the type of things that we're doing now, the only difference is we would take something apart for a customer, <clears throat> redesign it, cost reduce it, quality improve it, get rid of labor, and in most cases bring stuff back into the company that's kind of how we started benchmarking. Later on, we do what we do now where we do things on spec. Um, that's a little different, uh, a, a little different approach. But the big thing in 2008 was the paradigm. So we had worked on that for four years with NASA through SATS, the Small Aircraft Transportation System. And I was actually on the board of NCAM, the uh, National Consortium for Air Mobility. They that those two uh those two initiatives through nasa and through the basically the bush administration they were really focused on what are we going to do at the airports because there was a whole bunch of riots and things like that um uh, i can't remember what they called it but aircraft anxiety or terminal anxiety i'm not sure what it was but but anyway we felt that if we had a small a small aircraft that didn't really need you to be a serious pilot. Um, you had to be an operator. You had to know some things, but you didn't know any, you didn't need to know everything. And the reason for that is because Monroe and Associates had come up with an airplane that did not require a pilot. You basically told it where to go, and it would get there. And we tried them out. We took off. We had four planes that took off from. Um, um, Reagan Field in D.C. with senators and congressmen in it. It flew to Danville, and um, and then there was a big giant demonstration of what could be done and how we were doing it. And uh, there was eleven, I think, eleven or twelve SAS labs in 
in the U.S., Michigan being one of them, Michigan Sats. And quite frankly, uh, everything looked really good. So what wound up happening was uh, we had pretty much done the rough out architecture and in some cases the design of the paradigm, but uh, we didn't um, didn't have the money to go further. So I started canvassing around to find out who might want to invest in it. I found an investor and they were willing to put in a half a billion dollars, which I felt would get us through the prototype stage. So um, I was supposed to get that money at the end of September in 2008. But I did get was a, a telephone message saying, Sandy, very important, call me immediately. Such and such from Lehman Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> so if it wasn't for bad luck, we would have had no luck. <clears throat> yeah, it was a, that was a real kick in the head because I had already extended us into a new plant. I, uh, I, I um, had given up certain, certain work that, you know, would have paid well, but I needed those people for the, uh, for the paradigm. I bought land to put up a, a prototype shop. I mean, I did everything. I mean, I was betting on the come, but um, now I say that um, um, I gamble, but I don't bet <laughs> because quite frankly, uh, that taught me a serious lesson about how fragile uh, the, uh, the economy is. It's, uh, it's one of the reasons why we've never grown. I've never really had an investor here ever. Um, I own 100% of the shares, and believe me, I'm extremely conservative. Um, so, so, 09 hit, and famously, you didn't lay anybody off. No. Nobody. Nope. I, um, what I did was uh, I had a house in Canada. I mortgaged it to the hilt. Um, I, we had anybody that wasn't working was demon dialing to try and find work to get, you know, to keep us busy. It was, um, uh, it was certainly not the same as everybody else. Nobody, nobody that I know of, uh, even the smaller tool shops kept anybody. They just laid everybody off and that was that, you know, they just threw in the towel. Many of them just went to go and live in Florida and abandoned shops. I could have bought tool shop after tool shop. Um, uh, for free almost they just you know haul the crap out of here um but i like i said i had a limited amount of funds and to get us through with everybody um i decided that that was the right thing to do and that's kind of like what we did so we come out on the other end of the financial crisis it's 2010 11 we start supporting at the time he was post Chrysler, so it would have been Cerebus or... Well, we were working with Chrysler since when it was DCX. 1992. Yeah. Um, that's when Dan McCarthy started working there because um, he didn't like the attitude at General Motors. So he quit working for General Motors, and he went to work for yeah. Chrysler every once in a while. So we did work prior to the sale. Oh, yeah. Um, and that would be things like we worked on the, the Viper, um, uh, almost everything that they, they had in those days we were working on, but then they were bought by Mercedes and, um, a lot of the people that we knew abandoned ship or quit or were fired, uh, so that they could put, um, yeah. Germans in their place. Th then they got sold and they went <laughs> bankrupt, but we continued to work with them through all of that. Right. And we developed a benchmarking center for them, I think in 2011 right. and 12. And that was a, a whole decade of support. Right. Um, it's in the rear near recent past. So I don't want to talk about the programs that we helped and whatnot, but, um, well, we do have permission to, to talk, talk about that stuff yeah. by previous re regimes. So I think we could probably mention the, uh, the heavy involvement that we had on the Ram, which really made a huge difference. Um, they won, they, they, they won truck of the year several years in a row, but 
the real big thing for me anyways is they won luxury vehicle of the year yeah they had to change it from luxury car to luxury vehicle yeah. and that that's taken yeah. on bentley and let let me kind <laughs> of explain a little further of yeah. monroe's role in this so obviously developing a new vehicle is a billion dollar proposition up to two billion dollars if it's clean yeah. slate so we monroe didn't do all of that but we were very important uh, particularly in advising the early teams. So the, there are some teams called advanced concept engineering. It's when they're developing how they're going to transition the vehicle from their current design or whether they're developing a brand new clean slate design. And it's really where the big decisions get made. It's from the sketch stage is where Monroe could have the biggest impact. Right. And we were afforded the right audience, uh, typically high-level VPs, chief engineers, um, directors, and our team was critical in providing the studies, the benchmarking, the cost analysis, the weight analysis to move the needle on not only major architectural decisions, but also minor architectural decisions, all the way down to the material that is used in the sunglass holder. The How the rear shock is mounted on the minivan was a $7 a uh, $7, six pound idea that, that I pushed for the better part of two or three months. And now if you see a Chrysler Pacifica rolling down the road and you bend in and look at the rear shock, I know that that was one of the biggest battles of my career. It may seem boring and mundane, but we live and die for this because $7 here, two pounds there, 50 cents there. When you're talking a quarter million vehicles a year, a quarter million times $7, times a decade or more, because some of these architectures are, are in production for 15 years. They'll do mid-cycle actions. That's why these decisions and the impact that we make is so important. And uh, FCA, or Chrysler FCA, they made a tremendous improvement in market share in the Ram, in their SUVs, whether it's the Grand Cherokee, the Cherokee, and we were kind of proud of, of the resurgence of the third of the big three. And unfortunately, when Stellantis uh, bought FCA or they merged, um, a lot of that work went away. And that, that was timed right with the pandemic. So um, Monroe grew slowly, I think, from 2011 to 2020. We grew to about 70 or 80 people by the time we hit 2019. And then the pandemic hit. So here we are after about an hour of discussion. Sandy, you had just promoted me to president in the fall of 2019, but I started my first day was January 2nd or 3rd of 2020. And then we had only just heard about this sickness in China. And you had just spent uh, two months, I think a whole month traveling the whole world, and you got really yeah. sick in China. Yeah, I thought you had COVID. Well, Maybe they don't really know whether I yeah. had COVID or not, but I, I've never been so sick in my life. Um, by the time I got to, like it went from Detroit to uh, Korea to Japan. Japan to China to Hong Kong to uh, Qatar, Qatar, then, then on to Norway, England, and then home. So yeah, it went. I went right around the world, and uh, it's not the best thing to do if you're really sick. <laughs> not at all. But you know, there's one thing that I'm really kind of proud of that we did that we didn't mention, and that is the um, defense. The no, the Pentastar. No, oh, yeah. I, I want to. Oh, yeah. I want to stay too. I don't want to go too much into things that we're do we've done with defense. Um, well, the, let me just keep it light and lively. But the Pentastar was. Um, Oh yeah, was absolutely um, critical to Chrysler survival. Yeah, and this was during the um, yeah. So for those of you who don't know what the Pentastar is, it's the high feature V six uh, engine that was developed for. It was actually the Daimler Chrysler days two thousand five, six, seven, right. eight, nine, and um, yeah, it was actually called the Phoenix. That was the yep. code name for it right. back then. Yep, and the uh, that engine. Uh, was basically designed because I think Chrysler had four six-cylinder engines and none of them were any good. Um, and so the design was supposed to um, bring them into the new reality. 
And quite frankly, um, everybody abandoned ship on Chrysler. I mean, everybody was broke. This was like during the 2008 bank meltdown. And, um, and, but we stuck with them. And everybody told me, oh, you're never going to get paid and this is going to be the end of you and blah, blah, blah. But uh, it wasn't. We managed to scrape through and, and Chrysler did pay us. And Chrysler wound up with a phenomenal engine, and at the during that the the worst parts, there was very few Chrysler people left, and like I said, most of the folks that were um, most of the folks that were engine design houses and whatnot, they were definitely not interested in working with Chrysler because it was too risky. Um, uh, you you don't have much money coming in. You don't have much money in the bank usually. Usually a couple, three months out, that's about it. And uh, the banks, you didn't even know the bank was going to hang around. I mean, we had a lot of bank failures um, in, in our immediate area here in Michigan. I don't remember how many it was, but it was a ton of them. And so us working basically at risk for Chrysler was... It's kind of a big deal, but the engine now, it's like their premium, it's their only engine, really, really yeah. major engine. They've got... Well, they know, have the V8. The V8, but... They they just launched a, in, a new inline six. Oh, yeah. Finally, uh, called the Hurricane inline six single turbo, um, but they still make the V6, and they have an inline four right. uh, called the GME T4. I'm really familiar with their engine, so... They also have a smaller inline four. Yeah. But, I mean, for little cars. But the V6 crosses all the way from the truck down to it's the high-performance engine in the smaller vehicles. Right. Um, they have an Atkinson cycle version for the hybrids. They have... Uh, it's in um, all yeah. the Jeeps. Yep. I mean, yeah. yeah. So that was Pentastar. Now fast forward back to 2020. Um January goes by, now it's February. We're kind of getting grumblings that that's that's the time of the year where Monroe still hadn't secured our our work from our our large OEM. Um, we're waiting to get that that budget and the purchase orders to set our whole year out, and we're talking five, six, seven, eight million dollars worth of work, which really sets us up for the year. Well, the grumblings of the pandemic. In March, that put that kind of on freeze. We got to do a little bit further back than that. Um, I made a decision to buy a Model Y. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and um, and that was uh, not warmly received. No. I was pro Model <clears throat> Y. Yes, you and I were. I remember. Yes. But uh, the other folks um, that uh, that had a say in the company um, didn't like the idea. And, uh, and one one person in particular um, said that um, this would kill the company if I bought that Model Y. But no way, really. Yeah, he said that. No, she said that. Oh, yeah. Oh, so um, oh my gosh. Yeah, that was um, another reason why. But was, it has the octo valve. <laughs> and super manifold. <laughs> we didn't know that at the time. Uh, yeah, we so, did. Yeah, we did. Well, well, I, well, all I know is that uh, I put the money down for it, and that was out of my bank account. So um, we we got that uh, we got that thing on order, but when did we get it in? March twenty fifth or sixth, like the day it was three days bef before. Yeah, the, the before. Uh, our governor shut down the, yeah. the state. So we frantically worked to get it apart, film a bunch of videos. Oh, but we forgot the other thing. What? That was one of the last vehicle. That was the last day that vehicles would leave the gate at the Tesla plant. Yeah. So you talk about divine intervention. The last vehicles on the last trucks leave the Tesla Fremont plant and start heading toward Detroit. Well, and they show up just before they shut down. I, 
I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we actually bought that from someone else who was sitting in their driveway. Remember? What? Yeah. Yeah. We, we didn't buy it th- through Tesla. We bought that from uh, with a mar- slight markup. Yeah, and it was sitting in the driveway of somebody in California. But we still had to have the shipping company ship it. Well, all I only remember was that um, it we was got it three days before. It, it, it did align with Tesla plant shutting down, but we used a, uh, a broker to get that because it was so early. It was like VIN number 3000. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Hey, we got to be factually gonna... correct because there's wow. actually pictures of it that we posted of it sitting in that guy's driveway and I accidentally had the license plate in the in the shot, so I had to blur, blur it, it out. Hmm. Yeah. Anyways, well, just a little fact check there on that one. But the vehicle showed up and let's let's actually go back to March twentieth. <clears throat> so if you're online and you go to Monroe Live, the YouTube channel, it'll show that the channel was created on March twentieth. But our first video was released on April Fool's Day. So only, was that 11 or 12 days? 12 days. 12 days from me typing Monroe Live and creating the channel to the release of our first five or six videos. I think we released five or six videos on the first day. Um, I bought the domain with my personal GoDaddy account um, for 12 bucks, And I always like Saturday Night Live. And the reason I... Bought, I created the YouTube channel and bought the domain is you or someone had set up a meeting where we were supposed to meet and, and brainstorm ideas. So here I am. You just promoted me to the president presidency. I didn't want to show up with a verbal idea. I wanted to show up with a working prototype of what this would look like. So I used my own money to create MonroeLive.com, which was like a templated website. Um, where we'd have videos and I had the schedule and it said coming soon. So we got in the associate, the the classroom, our big room. It was you, me, the COO, the ex-president who was still at Monroe as an advisor, Al Steyer. um, A few people had called in and we brain, yes, Sue, we brainstormed all sorts of what are we going to do? And let's do this and let's do that. And let's do this. And, People were throwing out ideas, and some were good, and some were okay. Demon dialed, all these things. And then I verbally said, hey, we should uh, put the teardown of the Model Y on YouTube. And initially it got backlash from a lot of people in the room. Everybody but me. Yeah. And the reason for that was because this was suggested. We we were, uh, Alistair, my son, um, he suggested getting a YouTube channel uh, a long time ago, and he was uh, basically slapped down by almost every, well, you weren't in that meeting, but he definitely got slapped down by everybody else. And I couldn't over, I couldn't overrule that one. Yeah. But when you suggested it, I saw no other opportunities whatsoever. None. Yeah. Everything we put on the walls to me was, so we've already done this and it didn't work then. Pr- so. Predicting that people would say, Ah, it's too much work, security risk, all these things. I then said, ah, hold on a minute. And I I had already plugged in and I showed it. I said, I've already done it. It was literally done. I showed it. And the first video on Monroe Live, Aaron, you can actually check this, is a video of me in that meeting pitching it to you. I recorded it. Did you know that? No, I didn't. It's not live. It is me sitting at that desk in the meeting talking to everybody in the room. And I'm like, see, and then we can show the videos. It's like, how long is it, Aaron? Uh, 13 minutes. 13 minute video. Wow. I actually recorded the damn meeting and I didn't even realize it. And it's it's never been released because I was just showing that you could even go live. So the first ever recording that no one ever saw because it was private was me talking to everybody in the room. And it actually kind of gives you posterity because you can't make stuff up because it recorded the reactions of people like, ah, I don't know about that. You could hear everyone clown in it. Yeah. And I was just determined. I'm sitting there. I think I was even wearing a blazer, blue blazer. Yeah. Wow. But I, because I never even seen it. I no, you, nobody would have, you would have to have admin rights in Monroe live to see the unreleased stuff. 
I should show it to you someday. Well, I, I, I know Aaron. Yeah. She'll, she'll send it to me. She'll but, let uh, me in. Yeah. It's pretty boring. It's essentially going over what it would be. We had left the meeting, and people were pretty down on it. But afterwards, once the state really shut down, you came back to me and said, hey, that thing you showed in the meeting, can we do that? You and I essentially yeah. said, screw what everyone else said. Right. Let's do it. And then, uh, and as luck would have it, a lot of the people that were naysayers aren't here. Yeah, they uh, they have new opportunities. Oh yeah, but it saved the company. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. So in 2020, creation of the YouTube channel is kind of a new defining moment for mm-hmm. who Monroe is as a as a brand, and we're just trying to give more context behind the viewers out there. So if you're viewing us and you see us talking about some cradles in a 10 or 15 minute video, like, well, what do these guys do? Do they just tear stuff down and talk about it? No. I mean, there's so much history behind that. And I think that's what makes the Monroe brand really powerful is that it goes way beyond just the automotive industry. And now from 2020 to 2023, we've really kind of reinvented ourselves and what's old is new. Sandy mentioned we're doing more workshop and ideation sessions, but what Sandy really wants to get into is more new product development yeah. and more long-term work. So if you're sitting out there watching and you're an executive of a large corporation, having Monroe and Associates there, like you were for GM back in the 90s, was absolutely invaluable. So yeah. this isn't intended to be a sales plug for Monroe. It's just you know, Sandy and I and the management team, we have a lot of discussions about, you know, how Monroe can be stable and thrive into the future. And we've been through so many cycles, cycles of industry. We were heavy in the defense industry and then almost no defense. And now we're back into defense. We were heavy in automotive with some some OEMs. And now we don't do any work with some OEMs and we're with new OEMs. Um, the consumer electronics and uh, consumer goods space, uh, rice cookers and and uh, grills and smokers, that was a big thing for yeah. us two years ago. Now we're kind of slow on that. So Monroe, I've been at Monroe now over 50% of its existence. So when I showed up here, the company was 16 and a half years old, and I've been here for 17 and a half years. So I don't know if it's a good half or the bad <laughs> half. Sorry, Sandy. <coughs> uh, it's Every day is a good day, um, as long as you are on the right side of the grass. <clears throat> so, but I, I think that uh, I think that we've had a pretty good run. I think that the YouTube channel definitely saved the company, no question about it. I believe that our best days are still ahead. Uh, we're we're looking at a couple of projects now, uh, getting into um, vertical takeoff machines. Uh, we have several OEMs that basically have thought that maybe we can help out like we did for BMW's mini projects or or actually the 787. When that thing first started off, Alan Mullally, um had five people on that team and two of them at the very beginning were myself and Dan McCarthy. So if we can get in early, we can make good things happen. That's why I think that new product development is what we need to try and get back into in a bigger way. Uh, And I think that that's probably going to be mostly in defense at the start. But I know that we can make a big difference, especially when it comes to like uh, technology transfer. Um, That's truly in, if if we're going to see VTOLs um, move into uh, a significant part of the market share, they're going to need to be able to design these things for automotive mm-hmm. kinds of uh, volumes. Yeah. And that's where I think we can help out a lot. Yeah. And Sandy, you and I were talking the other day, we're going to keep an eye on the development of all these AI tools. Right. So not only benchmarking their utilization in the marketplace, how they can help us, um, but as well as the impact it'll have to how things are designed in the future. Right. And then also the finance industry. So we oftentimes do uh, paid calls with different either hedge funds or 
financial analysts, but yeah. that's an area where we can bring tremendous value because when we were at the Tesla Investor Day, we were surrounded by institutional investors as well as small family fund investors. Remember Aaron? Right. Yeah. She followed us. You followed you around the whole time. Um, I think we can bring that context because we can actually cut through the bull crap and give the real story very quickly, right. um, which is really worth its weight in gold when you're dealing with tens of millions, hundreds of millions, or billions of dollars of investment. An hour or two with us can uh, short circuit that uh, decision making process. Right. And actually, I just, uh, as soon as you said uh, financial institutions, in 10 minutes, I got one of those calls. So I, I think that, um, in essence, uh, we our, our objective was to try and give you a flavor for a little bit about what I did for a living as a kid and in, um, and in where we are now, the history of Monroe and whatnot. And I think we've kind of brought everybody kind of up to yep. speed. So uh, uh, I, don't, I can't think of a single thing left. To That's it, about. Sandy. Yeah. Yeah, and and this is one of our early episodes for the Monroe Live podcast. It's still directly linked to Monroe Live, our core YouTube channel, but because these are long form <clears throat> sit down, we wanted to slow the pace down. Yeah. And uh, oftentimes when Sandy you do your opinion pieces on the main channel or we're looking at technology or teardown, fast paced, digestible, typically in that 10 to 25 minute range, this will be the place where we can have these hour and a half conversations. So I know Eric and Aaron and Grace have lined up a whole slew of podcast um, guests over the next month. So we're going to start to fill this channel with the long form content. Mm -hmm. And then you'll also be able to consume uh, this through all of the audio outlets like Spotify and uh, Apple podcast, Apple podcasts. Aaron, what is it called? It's called Apple podcast. Oh, whew. Okay. But I think that pretty much wraps it up, though, Sandy. Yeah. All right. So thanks for listening, everybody, and yep. have a nice day. Absolutely. Bye now.